I think we heard uh, quite a bit today. It was a very you know, rich um, exchange in content. Uh, we have seen the various perspectives, how they operate, how they interact. But my task for now is to give a summary of what has been said. I will give it a try. The topic today, of course, was on uh, personal narratives. And we were told that some personal narratives, uh, which are, of course, connected to the broader narratives of society, can uh, encourage war and perpetuate the conflict, or they can curb conflict and work towards peace. We have started with that uh, very interesting uh, little film entitled It's a Matter of Habit. And I think there we saw the two narratives in a, in a rather um, artistic rendition of how they work. Uh, my understanding of that film was that it's all about learning. We can either learn to kill and learn to fear and learn to dehumanize one another, or we can relearn like children all over again how to love, how to be human, how to be restorative. The personal narratives, uh, we were told, uh, the phenomenon of personal narratives is not new. We had plenty collected from around the world. Uh, Julia gave us many, many examples. We were told that they are really human stories and that they all have a, a moral component and a moral core to them. Uh, but that they also reflect uh, and are embedded in the broader narratives of society. And the narratives of society which are collective can also play that dual role. They can either impede peace or they can enhance peace uh, as the case may be. We were also told that there are pros and cons to narratives and the expression and the sharing of narratives. It's not really a straightforward phenomenon. And that some narratives um, may simply perpetuate and, and, and get people and the audience to relive the conflict and to relive the trauma, whereas other narratives may give the opportunity to move beyond the drama and the victimhood. We were told that um, some narratives may also imprison people and imprison us uh, into historical memories, you know, where the human mind uh, gets stuck in the past. But we were also told that narratives can also help heal and help, and help us you know, renew our sense of self and our sense of a vision for the future. And then, of course, um, our speaker went into the issue of uh, narratives and dialogue, uh, trying to differentiate uh, the kind of dialogue that is constructive and peaceworthy and differentiated from the kind of dialogues that are, in essence, monologues, where you have two sides uh, speaking uh, when, in fact, they're actually speaking to themselves and not speaking or listening to the other side. And then we were given the directives as to what makes a true dialogue. That a true dialogue, it's all about a joint venture. It's about an unpredictable, an unpredictable uh, interaction between the two sides and that it has to have an I-thou component where the humanization process is really part of the exchange. True dialogue really builds community uh, and true dialogue is really reflective and true dialogue is really ongoing. It never really ceases. We are also told that the process of dialogue has a spectrum and it's a spectrum that starts from the call to vengeance, uh, the expression of victimization, confusion was the other level, and of course, there is also the phenomenon of embracing the other in the course of engaging in dialogue. Victimhood and the call for um, uh, vengeance, of course, are phenomena in narratives that block the process towards peace building. But there is also a pathway or pathways to go beyond both the call for vengeance and victimization. But there are certain prerequisites, we were told. There must be a desire to listen. There must be a safe, a safe place where people can feel free to express themselves. The dialogue must be reflected and it must also be ongoing. 
these are the prerequisites that lead to constructive dialogue, that leads to peace building. The social context in which dialogue takes place was also another component that was stressed. And that the social context, of course, is where the collective narratives and the master narratives are rooted. So depending on the nature of these narratives, they can either impede the dialogue that happens at the interpersonal and intergroup level, or they can support the dialogue. And we have seen many examples of this. When the nationalist dialogue set in, they, they tend to block and delegitimize everything that happens on the ground that is positive. But when the master narratives become more opened up, they tend to empower, they tend to support, and they tend to amplify the capacity of people in dialogue to move uh, even from dialogue to action. Then we had the very tangible and concrete examples um, of personal stories. I will not repeat them, but we had uh, an example from each of the categories. We had an example that reflected the call for vengeance. We had an example that reflected victimhood. We had an example that reflected confusion. And of course, an example that reflected uh, the embracing of the other. We concluded by a reference to the need to differentiate the narratives. Not all narratives are the same. And it's not always straightforward whether narratives should be shared or curbed or, or conditioned. Uh, but narratives are important because they are the human story. They are the story that people reside in. They are the story and the stories that link to our identity, to our sense of self and to our sense of the future. So how to differentiate them is really the challenge. And I think throughout the talk today, we received several directives and we were pointed to several pathways that can enable us to not only differentiate the narratives from those that promote war uh, and those that promote peace, but to actually transform narratives into more peace-enhancing and peace-inducing uh, narratives. We were also told, in conclusion, that there is a need to create also joint narratives, where the former rivals can create a vision and an interpretation of reality and an interpretation of self that has enough overlap and enough common points of reference to create a new reality, not only within the human mind, but also in the society in which these groups reside. That is really, from my perspective, the highlights of what we heard today. Uh, I would like to also conclude uh, as a, the representative of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace. I would like to conclude by reminding uh, all of us that uh, the Rotarian Action Group for Peace and the event today are the kinds of cooperative and collaborative initiatives uh, that I think uh, can build capacity for peace building. Um, for those of you who don't know much about Rotary, I would like to simply share with you what is often called the Rotarian four-way test. And it's really uh, a four-pronged test that uh, reflects the spirit of Rotary and also directs the culture, the actions, and the behavior of Rotarians. And this is the four-way test. Number one, is it the truth? Number two, is it fair to all concerned? Number three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And number four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? When I first came across these, this four-way test of Rotary, I was really struck by how close and intuitive it is to the work that we do in peace-building initiatives and to the vision that peace builders and, and peace agents and peace or organizations have and work with. And I would like to just draw a few connections to the example that we had uh, today, in today's presentation. If we take the first test of Rotary, is it the truth? A lot of what we heard today was about truth, was about the truth as it is reflected in people's experience. And we have seen that there are many truths, but in dialogue, we end up with a sense of truth that is much broader. The second one is, is it fair to all concerned? This is really the justice dimension. 
when people come together, the, the sen the, there needs to be that sense that justice is maintained, that fairness is maintained. And the third one, will it build goodwill and better friendship? This is all about building relationships. And what we have seen today is indeed all about building relationships. These relationships that are peace supportive and peace enhancing. And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And this is about outcomes. The things that come out of these processes, the ideas, the narratives, the projects, the actions, are these fruits well distributed so everyone can benefit. So these are some of the pathways to peace. Thank you very much and I hope everyone uh, does his and her part in this extraordinary historical effort we call peace building. Thank you.